Welcome to our series on social capital. My name is Tristan Claridge and I'm the Director of the Institute for Social Capital. And I'm joined by Lyndon Robertson, Emeritus Professor of Agricultural and Resource Economics at Michigan State University. Welcome, Lyndon. Thank you, Tristan. Always good to see you. And hello to all, the, all those of you that are joining us. Glad to have you with us. Uh, Lyndon and I have both been working on the concept of social capital for a long time, with Lyndon initially approaching it from economics, whereas I came to the concept from sociology and social theory. We're both extremely passionate about the concept and our different backgrounds and perspectives make for interesting conversations and engaging debates. In this episode, we will discuss the relationship between social capital and behavioural economics. Since the early days of social capital theorizing, it has been used in an attempt to resolve the, the frequent and important conflicts between neoclassical economic theory and observed behavior. Such conflicts have been described as economic agents misbehaving or uh, making predictably irrational choices, perhaps. And in behavioral economics, this is often described as, as perhaps nudges that could change economic behavior without offering traditional economic incentives. So, Lyndon, how has social capital theory changed you as an economist? Well, thank you, Tristan. Great introduction and a great question. Um, and I think on our very first show together, um, you asked me something very similar. And... Um, about how you how I came to be interested in social capital, which I didn't, which wasn't a concept at the time, that was in the mid 80s. And for me, um, there were behavior that I engaged in and that I recognized in others uh, that didn't fit the uh, selfishness of preference paradigm, the, the rational choice theory that um, is the hallmark of much of neoclassical economics. And, and it led me to think, uh, what, what is missing? Um, and one analogy is that if you observe people buying airplane tickets or airline tickets, and you ignore those occasions when they use accumulated miles, and you only observe the money transactions, you'll get a much different view of the shopping behavior and the buying behavior of people buying airlines. And for me, social capital has been something like that. It's the, um, it's sort of the missing ingredient that if you ignore, makes behavior that is often observed appear to be irrational. Um, and so I find myself um, often relying on social capital theory to explain transactions and interactions that I think are beyond the scope of neoclassical economics in many ways. And I think behavioral economics was um, motivated by something very similar. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems to me that social capital perhaps has a home in behavioral economics. Uh, I, I looked up, the, I'm not an economist, so I'm, I'm very interested in economic thought, of course. So I looked up the definition of, of what behavioral economics is, and, and reading from Wikipedia, it says that behavioral economics is the study of psychological, cognitive, emotional, cultural, and social factors involved in the decisions of individuals or institutions and how these decisions deviate from those implied by classical economic theory. So this seems to be exactly what we're talking about with social capital. So I guess the question then is, are you a behavioral economist? Or we don't typically see social capital as a, as a concept being used extensively in behavioral economics. So, so what do you think is going on here? Like what, what's the relationship between social capital, behavioral economics, where does it all fit together? Well, um, so people like uh, Richard Thaler and Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman uh, all uh, really uh, 
sort of important figures in the development of behavioral economics. And the focus was, and, and this may be overgeneralizing, was identifying behaviors that were inconsistent with what Richard Thaler called econs, uh, people that were selfish, fully informed, you know, uh, self-controlled, not influenced by relationships, and the hallmark of sort of the textbook in economics. And so behavior that was inconsistent with those was, was something that behavioral economists could point out. And often those were explained by behavioral biases, cognitive biases, tendencies toward one thing or another. And uh, there is now a long list of, of cognitive biases, and we have been content to say, well, that's just our nature. So here's, here's an easy example. Um, people buying ice cream um, are prefer ice cream that's labeled 90% fat-free compared to ice cream labeled 10% fat. And um, medical remedies that emphasize the lives saved versus the lives lost. So we know that um, that appealing to what have been labeled cognitive biases um, does change behavior. I mean, there's there's nothing different between ice cream that's 10% fat versus 90% fat free, but it it does affect us. It, it, we, our decisions are different. And we appeal to our social emotional natures um, to, to say, well, there's something going on besides simply trying to buy commodities. Uh, if we look all the way back to, to Jim Coleman's work on social capital, which he did primarily in the 1980s, um, he adopted, uh, you know, rational choice, what he called rational choice sociology, which was, I guess, the same thing. It was looking to extend rational choice theory from, from neoclassical economics by adding in those sociological factors that perhaps were missing, uh, that couldn't couldn't predict uh, human behavior particularly well. And so behavioral economics seems to be the same kind of idea where it, it's still uh, taking the, the fundamental principles of economic thinking, but then it's adjusting them, starting from that point and then adding in those things that are, that are missing. And it's interesting, the, the Wikipedia entry the, the list of factors that are included, I'm, I'm sure they're accurate, but they're psychological, cognitive, emotional, cultural, and social factors. They're the factors that are listed, and I'm sure they are the ones that behavioral economists are interested in. But it seems like the first one, or perhaps the first two, psychological and cognitive, are the ones that are focused on the most. And so it continues to take that individualistic perspective about human behavior uh, in the ways in which they're, they're thinking about what what people do. I mean, do, do you think that's accurate? You might have read more behavioral economics literature than I have, perhaps. So um, I think if I were to um, present a subtitle for social capital theory, it would be social capital theory or the social capital paradigm colon relationships matter and they matter a lot and um, which is exactly the opposite of what the econ and econ would assume and my my own experience is that i am every minute of every day influenced by a relationship and an exchange of some of, of something. So um, I was watching my granddaughter and my daughter at a tennis match, and they were communicating something. And um, it was not coaching, but it was an emotional exchange that changed behavior. So my view of social capital is that relationships matter. And relationships matter because we exchange something 
And I have labeled, I've referred to this as relational goods that satisfy social emotional needs. Uh, the original work, uh, the original term had a different meaning, but um, but for my purposes, I I think of relationships, people in relationships exchanging relational goods, and these are goods because they satisfy needs. And what I find missing in behavioral economics is sort of the the explanation of what is it that goes on between relationships that matters so much. And, and what if we ignore and we don't add it, it leaves us saying, we have predictably irrational behavior or people misbehaving. And I think the goal, I think our goal, and we've discussed this, is to try and maybe present a more complete paradigm by adding in relational goods, social and emotional needs, attachment values, institution, other things that allow us to um, explain uh, predictably irrational behavior. And once you include these other other goods and needs, behavior which before was irrational seems quite rational. And I, I'll, I'll take one popular example that in the literature, um, people showing up late to daycare center. And um, the economic solution was to increase the, uh, to impose a fine for showing up late. And the response was after you did it, late pickups increased. And the explanation from a social capital point of view is that you removed the relational bads from showing up late. I mean, I, if I can pay for it, I, I don't have to feel guilty. Well, that's kind of an example of where I think we can make progress um, beyond what is available, at least what I'm familiar with in behavioral economics, going beyond simply recognizing cognitive biases and other kinds of bias. I think um, there are useful explanations. Yeah, perhaps we should um, clarify what we mean by relationships, because from my understanding, it's it is it is the personal relationships we have, that, but it's also the ways in which we're connected. The relationship we have with our our, our wider family, who we may or may not know, have personal relationships with our, our wider organization, our wider society. It's the the ways in which we're connected through our social groupings that that of course the the fundamental part of that is is the personal social relationships that we have you know the people that we know but it's but it's more than that because it is the way in which we're connected is is that the way that you would understand relationships when we talk about relationships in the context of social capital yes i think very much so uh, if by relationship i understand it's how we're connected and we be we can be connected directly with another person we can be connected through a friend indirectly we be we can become connected by commitments to causes and organizations and places and so on so there's lots of ways that we can be connected and so we have to recognize the the many different ways that we can exchange what i'm calling here relational goods um, we receive a recommendation from another person. Uh, we find ourselves supporting similar causes. All of these connections, these commonalities that we've referred to in the past are means for exchanging relational goods that leads us to explain behavior that otherwise would appear irrational or misbehaving, something along that line. Yeah, and I think from a social theory point of view, the the idea that that economic agents misbehave or are irrational um, doesn't make a whole lot of sense because all you have to do to understand those behaviours that are supposedly misbehaving or irrational is is just simply to understand their their life circumstance, like the way they understand the world around them, and they're no longer misbehave, they're no longer irrational. 
they're perfectly rational and they're perfectly logical and they're they're in line with the way in which they understand the world. You know, if they're they're making decisions based on the nature of their social relationships and the way they they're connected within society, there's nothing irrational about that at all. Um, this is is perfectly logical. There's reasons for doing the things that they do, but those reasons are based on those connections, the like to the, the relational goods that they exchange and the the internal or external uh, validation that they might receive. You know, these are the reasons. So they're not irrational. And I think that's what the concept of social capital is, is aiming to achieve. But having said that, of course, social capital in the way in which it's been theorized over the last 30 or 40 years typically doesn't quite get there. You know, it's kind of starting from, from neo, neoclassical economic theorizing about human activity, uh, human experience and behavior. And then trying to add in those things that are missing, but it doesn't ever really quite seem to get to the real reasons why people do the things that they do. And I think that's where the biggest amount of work still needs to be done on social capital is to bring a, a rich and solid theoretical foundation to the to the reasons why people do what they do. I think I couldn't agree more. And I think to the extent that we're willing to agree to some fundamental principles uh, on which uh, we base our social capital theory or our social capital paradigm. Uh, and you're in the, in the middle of discussing uh, pillars of social capital, which I think are, is very helpful. To, to the extent that we can come together and generally agree that social capital has properties of capital, that it has to produce something that involves exchanges, you know, if we can um, sort of agree and, and sort of put forth um, a logically uh, reasoned approach to studying social behavior, I think social capital as a theory will, will improve its standing, which is, I think right now, if you ask, someone what is social capital you would get a lot of different answers and and surely they wouldn't agree and at least some people saying i don't know what to do with social capital theory you can't define it you can't you don't agree on what it does and so i think to that extent our progress has not been as significant as it could be if we could move closer to some kind of consensus about what does social capital bring to behavioral economics? What does it bring to sociology and anthropology? What what does it have to contribute? And and what do all of those disciplines also have to contribute to social capital as well? I think you know these exactly. are interesting conversations because I think out of everything that I've done in the last few years, what has been most helpful for me was to take the lists of factors that you often find in the social capital theories, you know, it's, it's norms and it's belonging and it's trust and it's, it's solidarity. And it's, you know, like you get these lists and I've often been curious, well, what do all of these things have in common? You know, is this an exhaustive list? Are there others on this list that we haven't included? And, and I think they're not exhaustive lists because people will always keep coming up with other things to add to these lists. And it gets bigger and bigger and more and more unwieldy and more and more complicated and challenging to understand. And so what I explored was, well, what do all of these things in this list have in common? You know, what is the superordinate of all of these things? And that process was very useful because what all of those things I described, belonging and trust and norms and solidarity, what they all have in common is they reflect our predispositions or they reflect our, our inclinations towards others, you know, how we understand what we should and shouldn't do in relation to others and when we understand that that's the superordinate then we can understand how each of those different factors influence our predispositions in slightly different but similar ways and and the, and we can then identify other ways in which our predispositions are influenced and I, that seems to be what's largely been missing from the social capital um, theorizing over the last 40 years is is digging deeper than just simply what the these lists 
and I, I think if if there's one thing we could change in in the social capital theories that exist is to move away from lists. Lists are great examples, but what is the real underlying uh, theory that is that is guiding these these lists of different factors that are being included? That's uh, insightful, uh, very much so, Tristan. And I think for me these predispositions, our attitudes and experiences and so on, to me, they lead to sort of this point. To what extent does another person's well-being matter to me? Um, is what happens to each of us independent? I don't care. It doesn't affect me. Or are we connected? Is our well-being connected? Um, and I have used words like sympathy and empathy and to describe the degree of interdependence. And and there, there, there may be better words. There may be a better way to describe our connection reflected by social capital theory. But if our well-being is interdependent and what happens to you happens to me or matters to me, then the way we allocate resources and decide questions and and invest in public and private goods is profoundly affected um, and opens up just wide areas for explore, exploration and explanation of how we can get um, better outcomes. You, used the word nudges. And of course, there's a book on that topic of how we can change behavior by recognizing these. But at the heart of it is, um, if if there's no interdependence in our how we perceive each other's well-being, to, to, what ex to, to how effective can we be in um, changing behavior? You know, can we appeal to biases and cognitive uh, predispositions to produce outcomes? Or can we be more effective if we simply recognize that this is the basis for sort of pro-social behavior and lots of things that we would like to achieve? And how do we get more of it if it's a good thing? And those are the kinds of questions that I think we should be asking. Yeah. Because we all agree that social capital is about relationships. And as we discussed, relationships really is about the ways in which we're connected. And fundamentally, the ways in which we're connected is those ways that do um, connect our well-being, that do relate to our concern and interest in others and our position relative to others. That's what relationships are all about. And it seems to be what's been overlooked in much of the social capital theory except very notably, as I've said before, except for yours, uh, and maybe a few others as well. The literature is extremely diverse and extensive. But it, it, it we tend to, in social capital theories, the, the dominant view is that a relationship exists, but we're, we don't seem to dig into the reasons why and what that means and how that really does influence the nature of our actions beyond the lists that we talked about, or well, norms and trust and solidarity and identity and so forth without really exploring, well, how does that connect us and how does that influence our behavior at that deeper level? And empathy, sympathy, uh, internalizing others' well-being, like that has to lie at the heart of, of what connects us. Maybe there's a, a positive side from these various definitions of social capital that we should take comfort from because they all point us to a relationship they, you know maybe it's a step away but and these lists often point to the importance of relationships so maybe we're not as far away as we might say well and that's right and i think like bringing it back to our topic for for this episode you know connection with with behavioral economics is that Social capital is fundamentally working on the same kind of uh, has the same kind of goals that behavioral economics does, which is is to to correct for or to to bring in those those 
uh, you know, the, to use the list again from Wikipedia, psychological, cognitive, emotional, cultural, social factors in 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 human action. Like to me, that's exactly what social capital is, is has been attempting to achieve for the last forty years, and there's a lot of parallels there with what behavioral economics is doing. Yes, I couldn't couldn't agree more, and um, so um, I guess we keep going. Um, yeah, I think so. So. So we've kind of run out of time for, for this episode. I think you know, this is a, an important conversation to have about what we're trying to achieve in social capital, because I think it does help to guide uh, where the, the definition and the meaning and the, the theory goes and where we put our efforts. So thanks, Lyndon, for your time today. Looking forward to the next episode. Thank you, Tristan. And, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. Look forward to our next episode. So do I.